Good morning, everyone. It's nice to be with you this morning and, uh, and uh, share some lessons from God's Word. This morning, I'd like to talk about hypocrisy. Um, I've been reading and listening to talks on um, the Sermon on the Mount, and it has uh, taught me a great deal that I hadn't really appreciated before. Uh, and I want to acknowledge at this point that uh, a number of my thoughts this morning will have come from a series of talks by Tim Keller uh, on the topic of the Sermon on the Mount. So if there's any particular point you really think is a good one this morning, it's probably come from him and not from me. So basically t this morning I want us to consider hypocrisy in three ways. First of all, what it is. Um, and uh, secondly where it comes from, what causes it, and lastly, what do we do about it? What's the solution to the problem? So, what is hypocrisy? Well, the word hypocrite is actually almost identical to the Greek original word hypocrite, or hypocrites, I think is the correct Greek word, and literally it means actor. That was the Greek word for actors, the actors who had those little masks that they put on their faces to show excitement or fear or sadness or joy, and they would just swap the masks. And we even see those, if you go to the cinema sometimes, they have these two masks up as the, the little motif that tells you that you're in a theatre. Now, don't misunderstand what Jesus is saying. He's just not saying all actors are hip hypocrites. He's saying all hypocrites are actors. When we are hypocrites, we are acting. We are hiding the truth. We are not showing what is really going on inside of us. So just whenever you think about hypocrites, just think of actors. We're all hypocrites in some way, in some little aspect at least of our lives. I came across a bit of information uh, this week that uh, showed that hypocrites um, Adolf Hitler was a hypocrite. Um, Adolf Hitler claimed that the Russians were, like the Jews, subhuman. But in 2007, they found Hitler's record collection in, an, uh, in the apartment of a, an old Soviet agent. And in that collection was mostly Rachmaninoff and Tchaikovsky recordings. Um, and just in case any of you younger ones don't know what I'm talking about, records are, are little discs that are used to put grooves in round and around and you put a needle on it and it played music. Um, but some of you may not have any idea what that means. But talk to your parents or grandparents and they can probably show you one. So hypocrisy is a very big theme in the Sermon on the Mount and I want us to begin there in, in uh, Matthew chapter 6. And we're given quite a number of clear examples of hypocrisy. And, and Jesus' reference to hypocrisy is, is quite specific. So we get very quickly an idea of what he means by the kind of acting that hypocrites do. So we begin in verse uh, 1 of chapter 6. Beware of practising your piety before others in order to be seen by them. Then you have no reward from your heart, Father in heaven. So, very quickly, he's straight away telling us that the kind of hypocrisy that he is particularly concerned about is when people are doing religious things, not in order to please God, as they seem to be doing, but in fact in order to get a response from people. They're actually mostly interested in their image, the reputation that they have, the way people see them. And they want to be noticed as seeming pious and religious. But they're not doing that at all. And so we will see that largely Jesus is saying that the hypocrisy that God hates and that Jesus hates, because he mentions it a lot, is the kind of hypocrisy that wants to look good by being religious, but not doing it at all for that reason, but have a completely different motive. In other words, really all be, uh, being all about your reputation. And his first example is in verse 2. And this is for the people who, who give to the needy. 
Right? When you uh, give alms, don't sound a trumpet before you. And apparently they used to do that. There were, were regular times per year when they would actually um, try and do a collection as they went towards the synagogue and they sounded a trumpet and, and then people would put money into the collection that they made and uh, everyone be, would be able to tell. And Jesus saying, don't do that. If that's why you're giving alms, then you're actually not pleasing God in any way and the only reward you could possibly expect is the one you've already got. That is, in fact, that you have impressed other people because they can't tell you're not doing it for the wrong reasons. Verse 5, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners to be seen by others. Now, this might seem a bit strange to us. Jesus is not saying that we should not have public prayers. But this is quite different. This isn't praying particularly in the synagogues uh, when they were leading public prayer. This is... This is going back to when they almost always spoke uh, in prayer to God out loud. A lot of us pray silently, but prayers in those days almost uniformly, um, even in the temple, were said out loud. And so when Hannah prayed uh, without any sound coming out, that seemed really weird to Eli. So these people, when they pray, they actually go to street corners where there's lots of people walking through and, and people are going to see that they're praying to God and people will be impressed and that's why they go there. And so Jesus says, well, your only reward is, is just the good name that you are going to gain, um, but God would rather have you do that in secret so that it's genuinely done in order to please him. And there's another one in that chapter down at verse um, 16. When you fast, do not look dismal. And worse, do not disfigure faces. They were deliberately going about making it very, very plain that they were fasting because they did that twice a week and uh, uh, if they were really serious. And uh, they made sure that when they were doing so that people knew that they were doing that. And Jesus says, just make sure you, that other people can't tell. Make sure that your fasting is seen only by God who's in heaven um, and he will reward you. And so the hypocrisy that Jesus is talking about here is the, all about the motive. Why do we do things? Are we serving God in order to get a good reputation or are we genuinely doing it because we love God and we want to please him. Let's continue into chapter 7, where we get some very direct, very challenging teaching. Do not judge so that you may not be judged. For with the judgment you make, you will be judged, and the measure you give you will, be, will be the measure you get. Why seek this, uh, see the speck in your neighbour's eye, but don't notice the log in your own eye? How can you say to your neighbour, let's take the speck out of, or let me take the speck out of your eye while a log is in your own eye? You hypocrite, take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbour's eye. Now, it's easy to misunderstand that first verse. Do not judge so that you may not be judged. Jesus is not saying that we should not be discerning. In fact, he's already been teaching us that we need to discern genuine from the true and and that's particularly obvious when we look at verse 15 he says beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly are ravenous wolves he, he's painting a picture here of and all through chapter 6 of of leaders false prophets in this case who look as though they're doing the right thing but inwardly really have all the wrong motives and are out for other things so Jesus is saying you've got to look carefully. This isn't immediately obvious just by what you see. Things can be done for good or for bad reasons. But you need to watch the person. And he says, you'll know these people by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorns or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good bear, uh, tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree there's bad fruit. So we have to watch these people long enough so we can actually see the outcome 
of what they are really uh, doing. And so here he's asking us to be discerning, to judge between the genuine and the hypocrite. So we must understand then what verse 1 of chapter 7 is meaning. And he's saying here that he does not want us to have a condemning spirit, to condemn people, to see things about them that we then say they are wrong, they're hopeless, they deserve condemnation. And he gives us this really challenging picture. He says, why do you see the speck that is in your neighbour's eye, but do not see the log in your own eye? The word, therefore, for um, speck is uh, moat or twig. Uh, And in fact, some people believe that he's referring to the chaff. You know, when they got the little bits of uh, casings off the wheat, the the little flaky bits that disappeared and left you the, the good seed, that was the light, fluffy stuff that was carried through the air and, in fact, is what he's talking about here. Tiny little things... And Jesus is saying, don't look at other people and notice the little things that they do. Do not condemn people because they are uh, not as good as you think they should be. We shouldn't think of that person and say, why is that person dressed like that? What were they thinking? Or why doesn't that person know their Bible better? What's really going on in our hearts when we do that is to say, I wouldn't do that. I'm better than they are. When we notice what is wrong with other people, we are doing it to bolster ourselves up and make ourselves feel better than we might do otherwise. And it's a natural tendency. Jesus is very particular about his words. He says, why do you see the speck? It's not that we go up and criticise them. In our hearts and our heads, we're thinking... I'm better than that. So this kind of person actually has this condemning look. They're always seeing what's wrong with other people when in reality those things are tiny. And he contrasts that to the beam that is in our own eye. Now the word beam here is talking about not just a log as it's sometimes translated, It literally comes from the Greek word that means to hold up. So it means actually one of those massive beams that supports the whole house. You're talking something across the whole house in width. So huge that you can't believe you could possibly ignore it. And yet he's saying that we have this massive, mighty piece of wood in our eyes that you'd think you could barely see past. And yet we don't see it. It's unnoticed or perhaps just not considered. How is this even possible? Well, apparently it is. Let me give you a couple of examples. Many fishermen stink, but they can't tell that they smell bad because they are just surrounded by that odour. And so their body just gets used to it. And they don't smell it. And it's only when other people sort of keep their distance that they actually think, oh, I smell. And some of us like to post things up on, uh, on our mirrors to remind us of important things or put posters up. And have you ever noticed that within a few days you just don't notice the notice? Maybe it's because the notice wasn't worth noticing. But apparently... Our brains are wired in in the sense that when things are there all the time, we ignore them because we no longer need to take any notice of them. And so it is perfectly easy for us to have terrible things happening in our lives that we simply do not see. Or deficiencies. We notice other people's deficiencies, but we don't see our own. And I think that's because we don't want to see them. We are choosing not to be aware of them, to focus on them. We want to keep on pretending because we want to keep ourselves feeling okay about ourselves. And so we are acting. 
we're acting as though we are fine and in a position to be able to judge someone else. But we're really living as a hypocrite. We're pretending we're ignoring this big problem in ourselves. Now, what Jesus is saying is he wants us to have the motive that is the reverse of that, that we see that the deficiencies in us are massive and the little things we see in other people are tiny and trivial and therefore not worth considering. So Jesus is saying that we are blind to the big deficiencies in our lives and that is such an important lesson for us to learn. We can have major, major weaknesses in our lives and not even know. The only solution to that, I believe, is to ask God to expose them. And so one message out of this morning I would like you to take home is that we need to pray that God will show us what is wrong within us at a pace that we can cope with. And God is very gentle with us. He doesn't show us it all at once. He gently leads us to acknowledge the deficiency as we can manage it. But we need God's help. We are blind to the major issues in our lives. I remember talking I remember talking to a very dear friend who is now no longer with us about my recognition of how arrogant I was and she said to me I thought you knew she wasn't being funny. She just thought it was so obvious, but I had no, or had not really been aware of it. And you think, and afterwards, when you begin to see it, it's so obvious. But we can just ignore because we don't want to see it. Jesus said of Nathaniel that he was a man in whom there is no deceit. And the message I take out of that is that a man like that is very rare, so much so that Jesus would point him out as someone special. But when we behave like this, that we see other people's deficiencies and not see our own, then we are acting as hypocrites. So where did all this start? It started in Eden. God gave a commandment to Adam and Eve not to eat from the tree in the middle of the garden. And we know that they chose to disobey God. They refused to trust God. And they chose to make their own choices about their lives. They wanted to grasp a hold of wisdom. And so we all have inherited that natural sense of wanting to be in control of our lives. Let's just turn back to it briefly because the consequences is very the consequences is very clear. <coughs> Genesis chapter 3 verse um, well, let's just go back to verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was a delight to the eyes and that tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. And then both of their eyes were open and they knew that they were naked. And so they sewed fig, tree, uh, fig leaves together and made loin cloths for themselves. Their very first response to this sin was that they felt naked, exposed, and they wanted to hide that. Verse 8, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called to the man and said, Where are you? And he said, And Adam said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. We have all been hiding since that day. We hide from ourselves, we hide from others. We are all hiding our deficiencies. 
We have chosen to set ourselves up as the God of our lives, that we can control our lives and manage it all, rather than trusting in God. And because we can't, we hide everything that would disguise the fact we aren't in control. And so we all go around with our lives in the fear that maybe we will not measure up. We won't be good enough to be loved or accepted or competent to manage our lives. And I see this as a teacher with my students. There's a, just a growing level of anxiety that's uh, getting enormous. Uh, increasing number of people who face panic attacks, even as just teenagers, worried about how they're going to cope, how they're going to be accepted, how they're actually going to, to get on in this world. The world is competitive and so we have to work hard to cover our deficiencies and we're anxious and we work hard and feel like we're under endless pressure that destroys our peace. And so we look to others and the deficiencies we see in them make us feel better about ourselves and so people spread rumours and criticise others and and ostracise them in order to, to make themselves that little bit higher on the social ladder. And we get anxious about our image, so when someone exposes our weaknesses, we get really angry. Or if someone tells us we haven't done a good enough job, then we get defensive. And when they prove to us that we really did what we said we didn't do, then we just start with the excuses. And we're just not willing to face up to the truth about ourselves. Because whether we like to admit it or not, deep down there is something terribly wrong with us and we just don't want to see it. And so we magnify our strengths and we hide our weaknesses. A survey um, of people who did job interviews found that 81% were secretly willing to admit that they lie during a job interview. We're all trying to hide what's wrong with us. One of the problems with my students is that the people who need the help the most are unwilling to ask. The confident ones, they come and ask for help and clarify things, but the ones who don't understand don't want to face the fact they don't understand, so they don't ask for help. But we're a bit like that as adults too sometimes. And sometimes in order to build up our own image, we just hang around with all the people that make us feel better about ourselves. We don't hang around the people that we think are less than ourselves. We just go and be with people who are going to make us feel good or people that will help us to make progress. And then we're showing that we actually care more about what people think of us than we care about what God thinks of us. And we're being hypocrites. And it's the natural way. It's not the way of Christ. So how serious is it? Well, it leads to sin and death. We don't have to go there. You all know the story of Ananias and Sapphira. They were hypocrites. They sold some property and gave the money to the, uh, the first... Um, or the, the collection for those in need at that time in the church there in Jerusalem. And they lied about how much they'd actually sold it for. They said they gave everything. In fact, they didn't give all of it. They lied to God because they wanted people to think well of them. And they were struck down dead. But I'm more concerned about at the end of the age. And Jesus in Matthew 24 actually tells us the end of hypocrites. It's almost not even deliberately meant to tell us about hypocrites, but it does. Matthew chapter 24, verse 50. Um, I don't want to read all the context, but it's talking about um, masters, or slaves and masters, and people who are working hard for, for Christ until he returns and, and uh, then it speaks in verse 48 of a wicked slave who says to himself, my master is delayed and he begins to beat his fellow slaves and eats and drinks with drunkards. 
And the master of the slave will come on a day when he doesn't expect him at an hour that he does not know and he will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So the end of hypocrisy is eternal death. So we need to be careful not to think this is just a little thing that we all do that doesn't matter. Hypocrites will not be in the kingdom of God. It's easy for us to misunderstand what Jesus is trying to say. Jesus is not comparing righteous people with unrighteous people. He is comparing two groups as he does so often. He is talking about the the good fruit and the bad fruit, the right way and the wrong way, the the house built on the rock and the house built on the sand. He is asking us to choose between two, but it isn't between the righteous and the unrighteous. And it's really obvious because of his wording. He says, when you go to give charity, which good people do, don't do it like the hypocrites do. When you pray, don't pray like the hypocrites. When you're fasting, don't fast like the hypocrites. So these are all religious people. They're all people who are doing things that they think are pleasing to God. He's talking about righteous people who are religious and seeking to do godly things versus hypocrites who do godly things but for the wrong reasons. This is something I've learnt from Tim Keller. He is looking at the religious community. He is wanting us to recognise that there is a real trap when we do righteous deeds. There's a trap even for speakers to do this just to impress their audience. And in Matthew 23, we get to really read who Jesus is primarily talking about. I'm not going to go through the whole chapter because there's a lot of detail there. But he is pointing out that the greatest example of hypocrisy were the scribes and the Pharisees. And he says, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. This is verse 2. Do what they teach you and follow it, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they teach. They're hypocrites. And he constantly says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. They do all their deeds, verse 5, it says, to be seen by men and to be honoured by people. Verse 25, let's just look at that if you're in that chapter. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside you are full of greed and self-indulgence. Full of greed and self-indulgence. They look good on the outside, but terrible on the inside. One of the amazing things is that Jesus cursed the Pharisees. Woe to them. That means he doesn't ask good for them. He's cursing them. Five times he curses them. He's very gentle with sinners, but very um, much the opposite with uh, the Pharisees who are hypocrites. And three times he speaks of their blindness to see what is going on. And verse 28, um, just to pick out a few verses seeing as time is racing on. See you also on the outside look righteous to others, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. This isn't just a little hypocritical thing you might accidentally say. He's saying these people have a lifestyle of hypocrisy. They are fake. They want to look good, but they're just acting, they're hiding the truth. They have a lifestyle of hypocrisy. And I think Jesus is warning us that we can have religious leaders who are hypocrites, who look good, but like Jesus said, inwardly on the inside are full of the wrong motives and full of greed and self-indulgence. It is dangerous to have unquestioning allegiance to leaders. And we must be wise and compare their actions and attitudes 
with those of Christ. But that's probably enough said on that topic. So, let us focus on the solution to the problem. The sin of Adam and Eve was to try to manage our own lives, to, to try and somehow be good enough to please God. This is the fundamental issue, the, the sin of all mankind. When we actually try and rule our own lives, we are trying to be God. And the big thing we need to realise is that we are grossly underqualified. We don't have the wisdom, we don't have the power to deal with circumstances. And this is an issue of faith. It's all about faith. Will we trust our lives to God? Let him be in control. But when we're trying to do it ourselves, we'll inevitably have this terrible problem of feeling inadequate, which is why we hide so much. We hide our inadequacies. I've given some careful thought as to why we feel inadequate so much of the time. And it slowly dawned on me that the reason we feel inadequate is because we're inadequate. We just can't do it. And there is only one solution to that, and that's to hand our lives over to the one who can control our lives and let him be the God in our lives. That we need to give up this image protection and just expose our deficiencies. The solution to hypocrisy is the gospel. The gospel is the solution and the answer to all of our deficiencies, our weaknesses and our needs. And we need to turn to God and acknowledge the truth. The truth that we are incapable of managing our own lives and incapable of dealing with our problems with our sins. That only he can change us and only he can manage our, li our lives. Our hypocrisy and our hiding will decrease to the measure that we believe and act on the gospel. And to do this, we need to change our perspective on ourselves and of God. I think for many of us, we actually think that things changed in Eden. When the sin occurred, that God just suddenly became a harsh, grumpy God who doesn't love us anymore until we earn our acceptance with him and and live up to what he requires, which, of course, is impossible. But the reality is not that. God never stopped loving Adam and Eve. He was no different in his love towards them. He had actually already dealt with the problem of their sin before it had happened. Peter tells us that Jesus was slain from the foundation of the world, so God had already prepared the plan. And God was already working that plan of salvation from the start. God loved us so much that he sent his own son to die for our sins. And when we think about the, the punishment that was given to them, they were sent out of the garden to work hard. Was that just to make them feel bad because they'd done the wrong thing? No. No. God's motive there was for us to realise quickly that we are inadequate so that we will surrender our lives to him and turn back to him and put our trust in him since we had walked away from trusting him. Everything he does is done for our good and his love has never stopped. But the hard part is it starts with us being open to stop hiding, to expose our sins and confess them. If we do, John tells us, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The starting point is to see the sin and say to God, I can't fix this myself. I see the wrong and I'm sorry. Please help me. And God will transform us. He will cleanse us from all unrighteousness and do what we cannot. And he accepts us in Christ when we expose our sins and acknowledge our need for his salvation that he's provided in Christ. 
He will remove that beam from our eyes and allow us to be able to get to the point where we can help others in love with the speck that is in their own eyes. Paul says in 1st of Corinthians, if we judge ourselves truly, we will not be judged. Confession cures hypocrisy. It's the first step to receiving all the blessings God wants to give us. And once we do, we then need to contemplate daily these truths that God continues to love us and is transforming us when we trust in him and he's providing all our needs. And then we no longer need to focus on our image or get defensive when we're criticised and we'll be willing to ask for help, even from our brothers and sisters. So how does it work? It comes about by knowing God loves us. We often measure our worth by the people who approve of us. But what does it mean to be approved and valued by the one who is the sovereign Lord of the universe, the most important person in all of creation? If God accepts us and values us and he proved that he valued us by the death of his son, then how can we care about what anybody else thinks of us? And so we can accept our weaknesses and forget about our image control. God said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. And so Paul said, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So the challenge for you this morning, are you sick of hiding, of having to cover up the weakness and inadequacy? Are you sick of trying to be good enough to please God? Then trust God and believe in his love and receive his care and the peace that comes from that. Because Jesus has reversed what's happened in Eden. He chose to fully obey God no matter what God chose for him to do. And it cost him his life. He chose to submit his desires completely to God and trust in him. And Jesus is the covering that God has provided for our nakedness so that we do not need to hide from him. And when he sees us in Christ, he sees us as perfect and righteous because we are in him. Paul said, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. And he said that because he was a Pharisee who'd been caught up in all the hypocrisy until he was converted. But he said then... I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I live, I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. From that I take it that Paul took Jesus' sacrifice personally. He believed that if there were no one else in all the world that Jesus would have died for him and him alone. And I believe that that is the most essential truth and belief that we must have in our hearts. And if Paul can take it personally, as a person who persecuted and fought against Christ, how much more can it be true of us? Jesus loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus loved you and gave himself for you. I'm just going to copy Mark from last week. I just want you to repeat this with me as I say it. Jesus loved me and gave himself for me. Let's say that together. Jesus loved me and gave himself for me. Genuine gratitude for God, to God for his loving sacrifice will keep us from hypocrisy 
and lead us into a life of integrity and glory to God in Christ Jesus our Lord.